follow the service on page 167. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are unjust and unholy. We have sinned against you without word and deed, and have not kept your commandments. Lead us to Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive reading of the intro, it is found in your bulletin. You will arise and have pity on Zion. Let this be recorded for generations to come. That he looked down from his holy height the to hear the groans of the prisoners. That they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord. And when peoples gather together, you will arise and have pity on Zion. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Nehemiah in the 8th chapter. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into that one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do they all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord.
place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all four witnessed to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, you also hear in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down the cliff. And passing through the midst of them, he went his way. This is the gospel of our Lord.
peace be to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our lesson is from the Gospel reading, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. Here's our text. Your fellow redeemed. Things went bad for Jesus very quickly in our reading today from Luke. It all started off pretty good for him. This was a Sabbath day. Everybody went to synagogue like the custom was. And this is Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. So he grew up here as a little boy. He knew these people. Everybody knew him. Friends, neighbors. This was almost like a, a reunion of sorts that he had come back home. And he came back home as a, as a rabbi, a teacher of God's word. And as the custom was with a visiting rabbi, he was allowed to read the lesson of the day and to preach the sermon. The lesson he chose was from the prophet Isaiah. That's a beautiful, gospel-centered lesson. It talks about the goodness of God. It talks about how God would heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. Isaiah's talking there about eternal soul-saving things God would do for his people. He would heal them with his forgiveness when they were brokenhearted because of their own corruptions. He would free those who are captive to their own unbelief and unrepentance. He would give sight to those blind to their own sin and the ability to see God's grace and forgiveness. This whole lesson that Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah is a lesson telling the people that God would be there to save them from damnation. And what Isaiah said that Jesus read to those people, Isaiah says to you and me too. We know something of what Isaiah was talking about in that lesson. We know what it is to be brokenhearted. We've been beat down by this world at times. And worse, we know what it is to be brokenhearted because of our own corruptions. Our own weaknesses have given into that easy path more than once and led us into situations where our life was just miserable. And it was our own doing. We were our own worst enemy. And we know something of this blindness that Isaiah talks about. We can be blind to the truth of ourselves, thinking way too highly of ourselves, not seeing how we are perceived by others, how what we're doing is an offense to others. We let pride, we let ego get in the way. And we can be captive to sin, prisoners, to our own little habits, unable to break out of ruts of sin. So we know what Isaiah is talking about. And we also know that the hope Isaiah talks about is God's gift to us as well as it was to those ancient people. Our Heavenly Father sees everything we are and He sends exactly what we need to face it. He has sent healing for our sin-sick souls. He's healed us through His word of forgiveness and reconciliation spoken to us right here in His church. He has freed us from captivity to our own unbelief, our own doubts about God. He's overcome our self-serving minds. He's led us to repentance. Just like Isaiah says, God has saved us from damnation. And he's done it through his Messiah. You know, when you hear a lesson like this from Isaiah that Jesus spoke to these people in his hometown, you can't help but think there could be no better message he could have spoke. After Jesus read this marvelous lesson from Isaiah, he started his sermon off with a rather bold claim. He said, today this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. So that help that Isaiah was talking about was right there in front of them, right there today in front of them. God's Messiah, God's promise was fulfilled. And it was as soon as Jesus said that, that things started going badly for him in his hometown. Initially, 
his friends and his neighbors, they seem excited about the message that he's bringing. Luke says they marveled at his gracious words, but almost right after that, doubt starts creeping in. Well, they thought to themselves, wait a minute, we, we know this guy. We know where he grew up. It was just a block or two down the street. We saw him as a kid. We know his parents. We know what they're like. His mother and father aren't perfect. He can't possibly be the Messiah. Well, like Isaiah was talking about, these people are blind to the fact they are their own worst enemies. Their own doubts, their own ego gets in the way. They start thinking of Jesus poorly. They reject him. These are actually the kinds of doubts, the kind of unbelief that threatens all Christians, including us. Doubts can take over our mind in so many ways like they took over the minds of these friends and neighbors of Jesus. When tragedy hits in our lives, we doubt God. We start wondering, where is he? If God really does love me like he says in his word, he does. And where is he? Why isn't he fixing this? We doubt God's love. We doubt God's ability to control the situation that has us in its grip. And maybe, maybe in our darker moments, we even doubt whether God exists at all. So we know what doubt is. We know what unbelief is. Just as Jesus' neighbors were driven away from God by their doubts, we too can be driven away from God by ours. Jesus didn't pander to that kind of doubting of God's goodness. Just the opposite. Jesus condemned them for it. He told them about a widow in the city of Zarephath, a woman who wasn't even Jewish. God helped her back in the days of the prophets. God did not help other widows who were Jews. Or he talks about Naaman the leper, a guy who was a Syrian. God helped him back in the days of the prophets. He didn't help any lepers who were Jews at that time. When the people heard Jesus saying this, they knew just exactly what he was saying. He was telling them that God wasn't going to help them because they were exactly like those ancient Israelites. The reason God didn't help his people back then is because they didn't believe in, the, in him. They had given themselves over to unbelief and doubt. And Jesus was saying, that these people were in the same boat. They too were separated from God by their own unbelief and doubt. Now just put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Imagine if this morning I was standing here in the pulpit and I told you that God is going to be helping the poor people in Africa who cry out to him, and God is going to be helping the widows in Siberia who have need, but God's not going to help you because your faith is a sham. Probably wouldn't go over too well with you. You'd think, I do too believe. I've been coming here to this church my whole life. Of course I believe. And then you would think, who are you to tell me I don't believe? Because you're just as big a sinner as I am, if not even ten times worse. You get mad. You probably are real mad. In Nazareth, they got so mad, they grabbed Jesus and physically dragged him to the edge of the city by a cliff and were going to throw him off it. Their doubt turned into total unbelief, which turned into this vicious hatred against God's messenger and his son. Jesus just wasn't one of them anymore, and they were going to kill him for it. That kind of vicious unbelief, that's not something that's just limited to those unbelievers outside the church who don't know anything about God. Unbelief is stuck in everyone, including all us good church-going Christians. 
we might not even recognize it as unbelief. Because unbelief can come in many different forms. Unbelief can come in doubts of God's goodness, like we talked about before, questioning whether he really is in control, whether he really does love us. But unbelief can also come in things like an excessive love of ourselves, an excessive love for other people, even family, which we allow to supersede our love of God. Or unbelief can come in the form of rebellion, where we think we have a right to ignore God's word and disobey what he teaches us because, well, it's just not convenient for us in the moment. Unbelief comes to us in many different ways, but in each and every one of its forms, it is dangerous and it is damning. Jesus knows that kind of unbelief. He faced it at the hands of his friends and his neighbors in his hometown. He faced it throughout his ministry. It's what put him on the cross, crucified him. Jesus knows what unbelief is all about. That's why he came. He came to face it, and he came to give us what we need to combat it. He has, of course, baptized us into his forgiving love that pardons that unbelief that all of us have. He washed it away. He delivered us from its control so it wouldn't damn us. He became the punishment we deserve when he hung on that cross to save us from the consequences of our moments of unbelief. And he's given us his Holy Spirit through the word in the sacrament. He's given him to us to create faith, right faith within us. So unbelief doesn't rule us to open our eyes to our sin and our eyes to his forgiveness. And that Holy Spirit is put in you today so that your faith grows stronger and you grow more secure in the love of God. And then God has done something that a lot of times we don't even recognize as a gift of grace. But it is a tremendous gift. God has given us each other to help in that war against unbelief. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't just leave us all here on this planet alone to fend for our life with him by ourselves. In our day and age, there's a lot of talk about people and their personal relationships with Jesus. That's not the language of Scripture. Jesus hasn't left us all to try and form our own unique little personal relationships with him. He has left us each other. He's left us as members of a church. It's like sheep that do best in a flock. If you throw them off as little individual sheep scattered throughout the wilderness, they're not going to survive. They survive as a flock, and the shepherd cares for them as a flock. And in that reading we had from 1 Corinthians today, we get this marvelous image of a body as a description of what our lives are now like, what Jesus gave us. We are set as parts of a body, not working towards our own individual ends or trying to have our own unique relationship to the head of the body, which is Christ, but as part of a unified whole, working together without concern for ourselves but just concern for being who God made us for the good of the greater whole. We are members of a church. And God has given you each other as a way of staving off unbelief and strengthening you in faith. So when doubt creeps in and you need someone to assure you, God has given you the voice of your brothers and sisters in the faith to speak his word of assurance. When you stray into unbelief or into sin, God has given you the voice of other Christians around you to point you back to his way, to call you out so that your soul isn't lost to that rebellion. The church is God's creation, put here 
to help that sinful man or that sinful woman that by nature wants to turn against God and to keep our feet in a right path. What a blessing it is that God has made us members of such a body. A place where together our unbelief can be combated. Where together we can come and feed on the same gifts, word, sacrament, be strengthened by the same Spirit, be given the same forgiveness, and built up in faith that we might not only serve God individually, but be there for each other. So as we consider how Jesus dealt with unbelief, we thank him for the gifts that he has given us to preserve us from our unbelief. His love, his forgiveness, and the gift of one another. May God preserve us in that. For, his, for Jesus' sake, amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by confessing our saving faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 174. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. Gracious Heavenly Father, you daily face our rebellion against your kindness and wisdom, yet in your love you do not treat us as we deserve. We thank you for your grace, and we pray that you might help us live better as your children. Grant us hearts willing to deny ourselves and our sinful desires and serve you in willing obedience. Sanctify us by your Holy Spirit that sin might not rule us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Holy Spirit, you have brought us together as your body and knit us together in communion with you and with one another. Build us up now as your church and strengthen us in our faith. Grant that we might strengthen one another and love one another as you have first loved us. Preserve this little flock under Jesus' care and protection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Blessed Savior, you send your angels to protect your sheep, and you give us all we need to face sin and death. Give your help to John Burks, who lays at death's door. Bless him with your grace and life through the forgiveness of all of his sins, and welcome him into your kingdom for your sake, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Holy Trinity, all we have is a gift from you and to be used not for our own pleasure, but for the service of you and in love for others. We thank you for all that you have given us and pray for wisdom in using it. We thank you especially for your grace and compassion that is new to us every day. Keep us mindful of you as the source of our lives and as our only needful thing. Lord, in your mercy. Graciously hear all of our prayers. Deliver and preserve us for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son, in him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and to be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.